Growing up, Lauren Newman loved going to her grandma Dorla's house and opening the kitchen cupboard. She had princess cups and goblets and chalices, and they were all unique. They were all funky, but we would drink and eat like kings and queens at grandma's. It was just so cool because as growing up from being a young kid to to even older in my college years, I was still drinking from the same green chalice that like was my favorite. So I, every time I went to grandma's, I knew that was my cup. Now that she has three young children, Lauren has built her own collection of random glasses from thrift stores. So whenever I go to get a drink, I always think of her. And not only that, it's so cool because now my children can think of her too. And that story that I tell them of, this is what grandma Dorla did. And they know that now. Every time they get their fancy glass out and drink from it, they're thinking of Grandma Dorla, even though they've never even met her, you know. And so I just think it's really cool to keep our ancestors alive. This is the How She Moms podcast with Whitney Archibald. I'm a mother of five on a mission to help moms connect with your kids, manage your homes, and create your own unique version of motherhood. I curate ideas from different moms so you can pick and choose what works for you and your family. This episode is brought to you by the fabulous Miss Freddie. I interviewed her for the last three episodes about organizing family photos and videos and using them to tell your family story. I love what she does so much that I became an affiliate to promote the wonderful resources she has to offer. Miss Freddie and her team will actually link to your computer to organize your photos for you, or she can just teach you how to do it yourself with courses and digital guides. You can get 20% off her digital guides or her backup boot camp course and another course, Creating a Family Yearbook, with the code HOWSHEMOMS, right at MissFreddie.com. Before we launch into this episode, I wanted to tell you that I'll be taking December off to be with my family and prep for the great content I have coming up in 2022, including a course I've been working on for years, which I'll be launching on the podcast in January. It's all about teaching kids responsibility, making invisible work visible, and sharing family work. After a couple of focus groups, I'm super excited to share it with the rest of you. So this whole month, we've been talking about telling our family's story through photos, videos, writing, etc. Today, we're going to zoom out a bit and talk about how we can teach our kids about their family history and help them connect with their ancestors. As always, before we discuss the how, we're going to talk about the why. Teaching kids about family history can help them to connect with something bigger than themselves, to see that they're linked with this network of people who've helped them become who they are. It can also broaden their perspective. This hit home for Adrienne Cardin when she realized that she and her great-grandmother both gave birth to their fourth children during a pandemic, Grandma Alberta during the Spanish flu, and Adrienne during the early days of COVID. We're so insulated in some ways in our convenient modern society that we, that this stuff shakes us in a way that it probably didn't shake our ancestors as much. Now they still lost relatives like my great-grandmother lost her sister to the Spanish flu, you know, weeks before she gave birth and she couldn't go to the funeral, things like that. So it was still hard for them. But I think knowing that this is something that people have been doing for ever <laughs> sort of gave me comfort that it was going to be all right. Adrian tells the whole incredible story about discovering Birdie on episode 71, how Adrian collaborates with her great grandmother. I'll give you a hint. They're also both poets. All this learning about the struggles of our ancestors leads us to another benefit, resilience. Here's Lauren Newman again, who we heard from in the intro. My grandma was just a pillar of strength in my life. And the things that she overcame and her resilience to what life handed her just totally blow me away. My grandma, when she was 28, she had six children. And her and her husband, my grandpa, they were driving down the road and they got hit by a drunk driver. And it killed oh. my grandpa and my aunt and my uncle. It was a, a triple a triple death. And so my grandma at 28 had four kids, had three people in her immediate family pass like that died from that horrendous accident. She went back to school, got her degree, and then taught at a school at, at Rick's College. And when I look over her life and I go, wow, she overcame 
so much as a widow at 28. And um, her ability to drink from a fancy glass and to give that to her kids after everything that she had been through is just so powerful to me. So I love to have constant reminders of family members that have done hard things, that have overcome adversity, that are resilient, that I can go, wow, this is where I came from. I'm the result of that. Like, what am I going to hand to my kids? Of course, I'm going to give them the fancy glass and and everything like that. But that resilience that she, she did, I just think it's so important to know where you come from. Learning about ancestors can even give us insights into our own identity and help us identify our own passions and talents. My mom, Susan Singley, often jokes that she spends more time with the dead than with the living as an avid genealogist. She has a few things to say about this. When you look at at people's livelihoods now, an adult person, and then they start to find out about their ancestry, they find that there are many of their ancestors that have the same interests and same livelihoods that they have. It's it's interesting to see how many firemen there are in my husband's family, how many teachers there are in my family. It it kind of goes along with the fact of family gifts, things that you're good at, things that you inherit from your ancestors, and it gives you a good sense of of what you were born to be or some of the talents that you were born to have. Our family history can also help us understand national and world history and our place in it. Jacqueline Johnson, as enthusiastic a genealogist as my mother, was surprised by how true this is. I have to say, family history has made me realize I like history. I just didn't, never, I could never relate to it before. I love history, and now it's like, with homeschooling, that's the subject I really do love to get into when I can, when I have time, um, because of family history. So I think family history can be the best tool for teaching your kids American history, U.S. history, like that or whatever world history if your family comes from other countries, which of course all of ours do. Jacqueline posts about her family history discoveries, tips and tricks, and lots of fascinating photos and stories on Instagram at genetic underscore Jackie. She started her own business to help people use DNA testing to find birth parents and solve family mysteries. You can hear more from Jackie in episode 35, How She Homeschools, and episode 51, How She Transitioned to Motherhood. Of course, my mom has something to add to what Jackie had to say. If you can find out interesting tidbits about people's lives while they were here, it it is just so cool because you're learning history. You're learning where their place was in, in historical uh, events. And it just really swells your knowledge of of the past, and it's amazing what it does to your spirit. Learning about the way our ancestors used to live and the hard things they've gone through is also a good way to teach gratitude, both for what they sacrificed for us and gratitude for all the modern conveniences that we have. There's also often a religious objective for teaching about ancestors. Religions all around the world and throughout history, from Hindu to Taoism to Shinto to Christianity, worship or venerate ancestors. And there are holidays around the world where people believe that ancestors actually walk among the living. And here in the U.S., we have a national holiday to honor our ancestors every Memorial Day. Of course, you can also just research and teach your kids about their ancestry for the sheer love of it, like my mom. I really don't know what it does. I mean, it's almost like it has a spirit of its own. It just, it, it's like a huge puzzle and it's, I feel like a private eye. I feel like I'm, you know, digging up stuff that is just so interesting that I just can't leave it alone. So I'm also going to give a big disclaimer here. Many people's family history is not something to celebrate. A lot of families have deep trauma in their history, perpetrated among the family, by others, and far too often by entire groups of people or governments. This is actually a topic I really want to explore in the future with the help of a professional who knows more about it than I do. I'm actively looking for people who are willing, either openly or anonymously, to share their stories about overcoming intergenerational trauma, especially moms who've had to figure out how to be moms without a positive example from their own mothers. If anybody listening is willing to contribute to an episode on this topic, please reach out to me. I think it would be really helpful to others going through this. Not to diminish the trauma one bit, but within reason, I think we can glean lessons from the sad stories as well as the happy ones, whether they're cautionary tales of what not to do or resilient tales of rising above adversity. 
And I don't think any family has to dig back very far before they find some hard stories or even scandals. Which brings us to our first tip for teaching kids about their ancestors, telling stories. Don't worry, I'm not going to tease you with talk of scandal and fail to deliver a juicy one, so I'll tell of one from my own family history. My great-grandmother, Clara, was just 17 when she married a man 22 years older than her by the name of Arthur Prince, reportedly a very handsome and well-educated prince. But no sooner was Clara swept off her feet than she was also swept off to a small mining town in California that was not a fun place to be for such a young woman who was used to vibrant social life in Sacramento. They had two kids there, but only then did Clara find out that her prince was not a prince at all. He wasn't even an Arthur, in fact. He was actually David Lackey, a much more suitable last name. In fact, the wordplay makes this sound like a made-up story. Lackey literally means the opposite of a prince, a servant. Anyway, this David Lackey character, my great-great-grandfather, also had a wife and children on the East Coast. And he wasn't even divorced from that wife. Well, our plucky young Clara packed up those two kids and moved back to Sacramento, and all three of them worked at a box factory to stay on their feet. She eventually married a great guy, only three years older this time, when she was 37. The grandkids called him Unky, and he had curly hair and used to hide pennies in it for the kids to find. This is what I love most about family history, the stories, and this is what makes family history come alive for our kids. This has certainly been true for Lubna Jamal, who grew up in Pakistan. I think in Pakistan, we are used to having extended families. Um, We call it the joint family system because it's very common for multiple families to be living under the same roof. Growing up, I I wasn't part of a joint family. Uh, However, we still had a lot of family around us. For my kids, it's slightly harder because we have such huge families from both sides that it it's hard for them to keep track. But they definitely like they will know their great grandfathers. And so we've discussed that. But I think storytelling is another great way for them to build that link. I had the good fortune that my parents did a lot of storytelling with us. Like my mother's memory is like a supercomputer. So she could figure out links between such and such relative and what they were. And so we always grew up listening to these stories. And then from my father's side, he used to serve in the army. So he always has these anecdotes to share. And anytime we're sitting there and the kids are there, so he'll just start you know, relaying it. And they might have heard it, you know, a couple of times, but it doesn't hurt them. It it ingrains it in memory to hear it again. And then similarly with my father-in-law, because sometimes he would start sharing those memories or like my mother-in-law, she's from Kashmir. She would share how she would go to school or, you know, her experiences from childhood. And we would end up having sessions where, you know, the conversation would last a long time and they can, they get curious. So storytelling, I think, has been another great way of maintaining that link. In addition to being a fabulous mother of two teenage boys, Lubna is a photographer and writer, among other things. You can find her photography at lubnajamalphotography.com and her blog at themeanderingpath.com. She's actually featured in her own episode on this topic, episode 58, How Lubna Jamal Teaches Her Kids About Their Heritage. Jackie involves her daughter Claire very heavily in her family history research and is constantly sharing stories with her. And also, yeah, when I find weird things, like cool stories, like, you know, someone dies of something weird or says the scandals or, you know, documents. When you see, find cool documents, show them to them. Like, this is your grandpa's war um, medal document or discharge from the World War II, you know, especially when they're learning about that stuff in history. Like, when we go, when we learn about World War II, like, I try to relate it to her great-grandfathers. Like, that's the war they were in. This was definitely my mom's approach as I was growing up, a very organic way to tell the stories and a good way to get us hooked. Well, I first start with telling them interesting stories that I dig up, and I make sure that they're really interesting. They're not just, oh, so-and-so is buried in this cemetery. I mean, we, we tell them what happened to them while they were alive and try to relate those events to things that happened happen in their own lives and that gets them a little bit interested if you don't overdo it you give short little snippets little little stories who knew how calculated she was about the whole thing it's definitely trickled down to us and my sister cassie gad a born storyteller is probably the best at it her kids just eat it up even when they pretend to hate some of the stories 
I thought I'd talk to one of her kids for this episode, so I interviewed 11-year-old Sam. Here he is, casually bringing up one of the stories he loves to hate. I'm glad I didn't have to share the one about Benny. <laughs> What's that? Uh, there were more pioneers. Uh-huh. Um, but he was, uh doing it and a lot of colds and stuff were going around the company he uh he was really young also and was really polite and he asked his mom for some soup and she said no not right now i have to give it to your father who's about to die and he asked to get again and it was like snowing too so he was cold and she, no she answered again and had to help someone else and in the end she asked the third time and she said no and when she came back, he had died. Yeah, we, we hate that one. Cassie says that all her kids will say to her, whatever you do, don't tell us the story about Benny, until she finally gives it and tells it, while they agonize over it. I think the reason they love slash hate it so is because it's good to feel deep, hard things in a safe place. And it's good to feel so much empathy for little Benny. The family history stories we tell our kids don't have to go back as far as Benny. In fact, Jesse McKinley, another enthusiastic genealogist, suggests that you start close to home. So the other night I was tucking my daughter in and I, I asked her, I'm like, do you know how me and dad met? And I thought she did because I thought I had told her the story multiple times. And maybe I have, but um, I was tucking her in and she's like, no, I don't know. So I, I told her and she was like totally captivated, wanted to know every detail and so, I mean, I think just simple stories, even things from your own life where you think, I'm sure my kids have heard that before, they might not remember. So there's just so many things that even if you feel like, I don't even know the stories of my ancestors, so how am I going to teach my kids? You could just start with yourself and teach them about your life. And then I think over time it will get easier to tell the stories and then you can move on to your ancestors as well. So. This interview with Jesse is from way back in December of 2018, when my podcast didn't yet exist. Back then, she was hosting a podcast of her own that ran for 24 terrific episodes, and it's definitely worth going back to listen. You can also follow her at Miss Genealogy on Instagram. I also like Adrian Cardin's approach to integrating little stories into everyday life, just by the phrases she uses. So I never sit down and say, it's time to do family history, like, that's not probably my personality. Like I'm so, my life is so improvised that I don't plan ahead enough to be able to do that, to pull that off effectively. But we do, but like you say, I, we do have these moments. I think we trade it where we try to integrate it just to whatever we're doing. So there within particular, so Bryant's daughter, my grandma was like a catchphrase machine. <laughs> and, um, one of her favorites was like, we're never going to see them again, which is be used in a situation where we would do something embarrassing or like in front of someone and uh, my kids would, you know, be sort of like covering their eyes, like, mom, you're embarrassing me. <laughs> and then Barbara, the voice of Barbara comes to me and says, we're never going to see them again. So that's become the sort of little catchphrase in our house, in our house where we to fight embarrassment when we're afraid to try something new <laughs> or we potentially embarrass ourselves in public. My mom isn't always sneaky and subtle about teaching family history. She also goes big, as you'll see later on. Here's one of the fun projects she had us do at a family reunion. I assigned each family a story in family history that, that I knew of that I felt like fit their family dynamic. And so I had them act out the story and it was just kind of little skits that that we did at a family reunion. It was very, it went over very well. And the kids really thought that was fun because I gave um, a redheaded ancestor to a family that had a redheaded girl. And it, it was it was a story about how the Native Americans just really loved her, her hair and wanted to touch it. And that really caught fire with her, you know, to think that she has an ancestor that had red hair too. My friend Jennifer Anderson uses family stories as bedtime stories. The way she talks about collecting stories reminded me of one of my favorite John Steinbeck quotes. In East of Eden, one character says, I eat stories like grapes. So I think of her collecting stories that then she can feed to her children like juicy grapes. 
So we love doing story time, like when they go to bed, like, so I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm perfect at this and I definitely don't do it every night, but whenever they want a story, I try a couple times a week to do a story from their family history. And it's actually, I knew a few right off the top of my head, but I had to kind of go look them up and like find out more. So it's been really fun, but I try to find stories from our family history. And actually now every time I'm like around my grandma's, I like bring my phone recorder and I have them tell us stories because they remember stuff and that I just, you can't find on family search. You can't find anywhere, you know? Um, and, and I've co- collected a lot of good stories from them. And oh, then I have my kids listen to it. Thank you, Jen, for that transition because the next tip is to interview living ancestors. Libna Jamal is another great example of this. She wrote a really fascinating blog post about the story of her father-in-law during the 1947 partition of India and Pakistan, which I'll link in my notes and on my website in the post for this episode. Because of this podcast, I've been able to interview people from my own family history, and I plan to do more. I interviewed my mom for episode 8, I'm turning into my mother, or at least I hope so, in which she tells some of her funniest stories. And I interviewed my equally hilarious grandmother in episode 20, How Donna mommed back in the day, you won't want to miss her down-home poetry. Of course, my family history-loving parents were also good about interviewing their own parents, and as a result, I have two-hour video treasures of all four grandparents. Here's a good story from my paternal grandmother, Claire. He saw many of his friends drowned in the Sacramento River, so he would never allow us to go anywhere near a swimming pool or river or anything, so we never learned to swim. One time, my cousin, she used to go down uh, bathing, sunbathing, at the American River down on the beach there. And one day, she talked us into going with her. Skinny so we didn't dare tell mother and dad. No, we weren't skinny. <laughs> <dipping. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> but it was a time when rubber bathing suits, was the first rubber, rubber bathing, bathing suits rubber that, bathing. that were ever made. This, this year they made them. They were <laughs> something new. The Florence and I both had <laughs> Well, they weren't bad looking, but they, anyway, mine split. <laughs> we, had to, we had to park down on the road and walk in back into where the river was. So, of course, my mother and dad didn't know we'd gone down there. When my swing suit broke, I had to go back to the car and get my clothes on. And at that time, my dad was working on a house, building a house, and he had to go right by this road where we were <laughs> we were parked. And sure enough, if he didn't see, right as I came back, he was coming to work on this house. So we got in trouble for going. It's not a coincidence that I'm releasing this episode during the holiday season. I'm assuming that many of those listening will have the chance to get together with extended family and will therefore be able to implement tip three, help your kids get to know their living ancestors. I'm not talking about a quick cheek pinch and then running off to play. Really help them have some quality interactions. Two of my mother-in-law's six sisters just came into town, and I packed up the kids to go visit. While we were talking, I could tell my kids were starting to get bored with our adult-led conversation. So before the kids could find other things to do, I asked their great aunts to tell some stories about what their grandma was like growing up, and the aunties even ended up tag-teaming while they told a story to the kids with funny voices and all. Of course, we can't always visit or receive visits from our living ancestors, but isn't it amazing that we live in a time where we can see them without even being in the same country through technology? Making the time to schedule video chats with extended family is definitely worth the effort. Wendy castellanos Wolf is grateful that her parents made the effort to help her get to know far-flung relatives. Every year, we had family members come up to the U.S. to visit us. And so, you know, they would bring us uh, food items and presents, news. Uh, we would have a weekly phone call uh, where we would talk to my grandma and all the aunts. And honestly, I dreaded it as a child because, you know, you're a kid. I don't want to talk to the old people. <laughs> on the phone. But I value that very much now looking back because it did keep me connected to my family. And it it felt like we were always current with each other's lives, you know, up to date with each other's lives. It wasn't like, oh, I haven't talked to you or seen you in a million years. So who are you, stranger? It was more like, I talked to you last Saturday and I know exactly what happened. So yeah, my parents were very good about um, 
keeping us connected to our roots through technology, you know, just talking on the phone. My aunt would write letters. She would write letters all the time, send cards for every holiday and birthday. I mean, it was just a lot of communication. And so, yes, growing up, I did feel uh, very connected, even though as a kid growing up in the U.S., you try to reject all that, right? And like, be just like your friends, assimilate or be as American as possible because that's what was happening at the time. Wendy is the co-host of the wonderful Mama Sita podcast and an accomplished flamenco dancer. Lubna Jamal takes her boys back to Pakistan as much as she can, especially to celebrate special occasions with family and experience the culture. I think when it comes to culture, in a snapshot, you should attend a wedding. Like it, it has everything, right? The food, the dresses. So that's the perfect cultural experience as a wedding and religious, actually. So recently, my nephew got married. And so that was the first wedding that my sons were very involved in. So they prepared dances, like the local, like traditional dances, and they wore their traditional clothes. And they had a blast. And so, so that was another great connection to uh, understanding where they were coming from. And they would never have had that had it not been for that opportunity. And if they were living in Pakistan, it becomes kind of um, taken for granted yeah. because you have a wedding season, right? It's everybody's getting married in December. You'll always dress up and you'll go, right? But for kids here, that's not a very common occurrence. So yeah. it's you know few and far between. And so we try to maximize on those. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't have to limit our family celebrations to those who are living. Funerals are actually a great example of this. I know, I just called funerals a celebration. They are obviously sad occasions, especially the sudden and expected ones, but, but funerals can also be a celebration of life. This was especially true of my Grandpa Dayton's funeral. This man had it all planned out. He left strict instructions and made everyone promise to carry them out. And they did, for the most part. For one thing, instead of the traditional flower bouquets, he wanted arrangements of chocolate licorice and Oreos, his two favorites. He didn't want any talking in the service, just singing. That's one request we broke, but with just a little bit of talking. It was mostly a funerary concert with all his favorite songs. He also wanted us to take out the back seats of a school bus and use that as the hearse to carry his casket to the cemetery, since he spent his career as a school teacher and then principal. Well, that didn't quite happen either, but the school district did let us borrow a bus to transport all his children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren to the cemetery. We drove past his childhood home and the schools where he taught on the way. Of course, to further honor my musical grandpa, we all sang at top voice on the ride. I'll post a video of that on HowSheMoms.com, my YouTube channel, and on Instagram this week. Jessie McKinley also came up with a great way to celebrate her ancestors with her kids. Birthday parties. My kids love to celebrate anything, but uh-huh. I'm kind of, like, I'm not big into throwing these big elaborate parties, so I think that's part of the reason why it took me so long to, like, get on board with this, because, right. like, I already have five kids, so I have so adding another party and kind of felt overwhelming, but I finally got to the point where I was like, it doesn't need to be anything big or grand. It's just going to be a very simple thing, and obviously people could make it big and grand if they wanted to, but that's right. just not my personality, so... <laughs> And then at the beginning of this year, that's when I really started to do the parties. So I just told my kids that we were going to celebrate. And actually, I need to back up because my mom for Christmas gave us a, um, it's like a desktop calendar. I can't really explain it, but she made um, a page for each of our ancestors with their picture, their oh. birthday, their name, and where they were born. And then you can just, like, flip through it, and we have it up on one of our bookshelves in our living room so we can always see whose birthday it is that day. So that was what she gave us for Christmas, and it was this huge labor of love that she made for us. And I was like, to you know, my kids love to see the picture, but to take it even one step further and to say, okay, this month. And so what I do is every month, or and it's not actually every month, but I try to, you know, that was the intention, and it's, it's actually really been about, like, once a quarter that we've done it. Okay. Yeah. I'm proud of what we've done. So um, Yeah. So yeah, we I have a little letter board, so we write I have the kids help me put all like we write just their first names up up on the letter board. Uh-huh. And um and then we sing happy birthday to all of them and we either have like a cupcake or I make a little cake or we just have cookies or whatever we have on hand, you know. So but we just sing a quick song. I show them the pictures of whose birthday it is that month. Uh-huh. And 
and then if I have any just really short stories about them or if I knew any of them, then I can tell stories of what I remember. I'm just hoping that it is going to trickle down to my kids too and that they'll remember that they come from such a long line of strong people and also people who struggled and who went through really hard things. And so I am hoping that it will help them in their lives. I love that flip chart idea, and it fits well with the next tip. Look at photos of your ancestors with your kids. This can be tricky, especially if all the old photos are in a box in Aunt Leah's attic. So the first step is to track them down and then to digitize them or outsource that and send them off to be digitized somewhere else. Miss Freddie does this for people, but there are a lot of other companies that will do this too, either sending them through the mail, which granted can be a little nerve-wracking, or you may have one locally. The good thing about digitizing extended family photos is that you should be able to split the cost with whoever else wants copies. Once you have the photos digitized, it's easy to share them with anyone who wants them, which is really miraculous if you think about how hard it used to be to get extra prints. FamilySearch.org, a free website we'll talk more about later, allows you to upload photos and link them to the names of your ancestors in your family tree so anyone can access them. This is a great way to share among family members, some of whom you probably don't even know. Jackie Johnson loves old photographs and playing around with them. In this clip, she's talking about sharing those photos with her daughter. She loves to look at the pictures. The more pictures you can get on FamilySearch or, or Ancestry, whatever, whatever program you use, the more your your family can see the pictures digitally is the, the best. So if you have old pictures, scan them, show them. If you have a MyHeritage account, you can colorize your photos for free. It's so fun and addicting. I um, saw some of those that you posted. Those are cool. It's cool. I mean, I really love black and white photos. That's, those are awesome. But seeing them in color, it's like, oh, like that. it just makes it cool. You know, you can see them, get them a little bit more real. Lauren also ordered a different kind of cool visual of her pedigree chart, which is just a chart that shows the generations that came before you. She ordered a chart in the shape of a wheel for their family and hung it in their living room. She got it from FamilyTreeChart.com, and it's really cool. I've seen several examples of other people who have an ancestor wall made up of photos that they printed off and framed. Then, of course, you can make books about your ancestors. I made a book about my grandpa's family a few Christmases ago with photos and stories from all his ancestors, and it was really fun to make. I need to get started on the next one, actually. It did take a lot of research and work, but I was able to do it all with resources from Family Search. Lubna took a simpler approach when her kids were little, and I love it. When my kids were younger, I had made, for each one of them, I kind of made like a photo album. And I had um, interspersed like between their birth pictures and first birthdays, things like that. I started putting in pictures of some of our family historical pictures in there. So uh, they would like, you know, peruse through it and they'll be like, who's that or who's that? And so it, it would be a good conversation starter of, OK, this is this person or this is this person. Years ago, I sat down with my sister and my mom and we made almost like this laminated booklet of ancestors and stories that a child could understand and so we would have their picture or the daguerreotype of the ancestor and then in a child form what what that person went through and so my kids can flip through it and go oh you know that's great grandpa arnold miller he helped bring like seven loads of people across the United States to the Salt Lake Valley, you know, unique things like that. Cami Coburn, whom you've heard from in the last few episodes, did a similar thing with her siblings, dividing and conquering. So what we did in my family for a long time, when me and my sisters, when we got together, uh, we would come with like research done on a member of our family history on on either side. So I would write maybe about my great great grandmother or someone would write about this person that person so when we come together we have these stories that were are printed and then we just exchange them so then so then we don't have to do all the research on every person side note here cammy also has the advantage she can just look up super entertaining videos of her grandma bev on youtube to show her kids whenever she wants this is because her grandma was a frequent guest on a cooking segment on the david letterman show for 10 years from 1989 to 1999 and she is hilarious. I actually even remember her from back then, before I knew Cammie or her family. You should totally look up the videos. Just search for Bev Tanner and David Letterman. It's amazing. 
Okay, now onto one of my favorite tips, singing ancestral songs. This sounds a bit like we're doing Gregorian chants or something, but I'm mostly talking about favorite lullabies or just songs you sing around the house. I made a deliberate effort with all my kids to keep my grandparents' and parents' favorite lullabies in our regular rotation, even the depressing one that was one of my grandma's favorites about babes in the woods who died there together with the birds. My maternal grandpa, the one with the musical funeral, probably sang about as much as he talked. So I've taught my kids a lot of his favorite silly songs, like this one. Last night as I lay on my pillow, last night as I lay on my bed, I stuck my feet out the window, next morning my neighbors were dead. Bring back, oh bring back, oh bring back my neighbors to me, to me. Bring back, bring back, oh bring back my neighbors to me. And there were many more songs where that came from. He also bounced all of his children, grandkids, and great-grandkids on his knee to this song. Oh, we go round, broke down, as we go round and round, the music slow, the lights are low, and the merry-go-round goes oom pa pa oom pa pa oom pa oom pa oom pa pa merry-go-round go round, woo! That was my middle son Abel that was having the time of his life on that dear old knee. I'm so glad we have footage of my grandpa singing that song. My paternal grandmother, Claire Singley, was also a singer, and we have a couple of recordings of her, too. Here's one from that same interview my parents did. Here she's singing one of the songs her own father used to sing, so we got a double family history whammy with this one. There was a boarding house not far away, where they served onion patch three times a day. Oh, how the boarders yell when they hear the dinner bell. Oh, how the onions smell three blocks away. (laughs) She always sang it. Of course, it's too late to capture the songs or speaking voices of some of your ancestors who've already died, but run, don't walk to capture the voices of the ones that are still alive. It's priceless. The seventh tip is a quick one. If you've inherited any family heirlooms, make sure to tell your kids the story behind them. If you don't have possession of them, but they exist, you could always take picture of them like my cousin did at my grandma's house and even write little stories about their significance. The ship may have also sailed for some of you on this next tip. Give your kids names from family history. Give your kid to give your kids names from family history. My my son Jonas got his name from his great grandfather, and my daughter Claire was named after my grandma. The others have middle names from beloved ancestors. My nephew Sam is very proud to be a namesake for one of his ancestors, who also has a sad story. His name was Samuel, also, and he uh, went on the pioneer journey. And his mother was named Eliza, which is all Eliza Gad, which is also who my uh, sister is named after. And uh, he died when he was uh, really little while he was doing it. But he was a great pioneer and, like, had a good, like, story and was uh, always happy when he was alive and was a very... Very glad they were going on the pioneer quest before he died. Um, his mother, Eliza, she lost her uh, husband, who was also named Samuel, and her son on that trip, and she got snow blind. Uh, uh, so there's a great story about how she was being led on the pi- through the pioneers, uh, holding hands to her daughter as she led her forward. And in the end, she did make it. Does it make a difference to you to know that brave people came before you? Yeah, they went through so many hard things. What can I do to, like, live up to them and stuff? And they're they're kind of like a role model for me, really. Who I am, what I need to be, and stuff like that. The ninth tip is to teach your kids how to research their family history, or, if you don't know how either, to learn alongside them. Here's my mom to give an overview. The coolest thing is that a lot of people have been doing family history and and on a free site like Family Search, you may find out that a lot of research has already been done on ancestors that are far enough back that that a lot of people connect to them. So if you can find the ancestor that's far enough back and just go to familysearch.org and Type in what information you know about them, their first and last names, approximate places that that they lived. Then it'll bring you up 
a whole bu- bring up a whole bunch of people that it could be, and then you just kind of go through them. When you get onto their page, there's a page called the memory page and a source page. You can click on the source page and the memory page to see if there's any information that is written about them. The page that you will first open up has their vital statistics. It tells about um, their birth, their birthplace, you know, whatever they know will be there, including their children and their parents, if that's known. But if you can't find them in there, what you do is type in, you add a person, and suddenly you'll get hints that tell you a little bit about their life and where you know, this could be them. Is this them? You know, that, that sort of thing. And then you can start adding sources and memories of your own. They can be pictures. They can be documents and stories. People can type in a story and put in there. So, so the documents will be separate. Those will be things like a marriage record or something like that. But you can find those also in sources. The really cool thing about kids, teenagers, is they can manipulate that computer so easily that they just have to be shown just one time how to look at, at the programs that you use to, to do research. I use Family Search the most, but a lot of people use Ancestry.com. But she, she sat down and just looked at what I was doing, and she goes, Grandma, I just found a source to go with this per- person. Can I add this source to them? So she's clicking on these things. She has all she has the source all added and and then she says, "Look." And <laughs> I um I looked and she was she had actually found a link that I had not found to another ancestor and she was she was linking him and finding out that that was the case. She couldn't pull herself away. She just really loved it. So when she went um somewhere for an activity, I was looking at, at this page that she'd been working on, and I found out that there was a family that had a a daughter named Flora, Cora, and Laura. <laughs> and she thought that was just so funny. They had rhyming names, and one of them was her name. Jackie's first tip, as far as kids are concerned, is to get your kids their own account. When she was eight years old, she got a family search account. That's how old you have to be, um, eight years old. And um, I wouldn't, I think that's totally important that kids have their own account and uh, that you don't freak out that they're using it or working on it because you don't like want to freak out like, oh, you're going to do something wrong. Let them do whatever they want. (laughs) If they're interested in it, then let them do it because the family history is not interesting to most people. (laughs) So if your kid finds an interest in it, let them have their own account let them do what they want, teach them, show them, or if you don't know, get in contact with someone who can. Um, If they want to do it, let them have their own account and do it. They should have their own account. They shouldn't be working on yours. Um, And of course, in family search, the tree is everybody's tree, but you have your own account that you can log into. Um, So any changes or mistakes they make uh, can be fixed by someone else or you. It doesn't matter. Um, I find this mistakes. I'm like, oh my gosh, why did this person do that? And then I'll click and see who did it. I'm like, oh, that was me 10 years ago when I was just starting out. Okay, I'll forgive myself. Then there's a paid site, Ancestry.com. Ancestry is a fabulous site for finding family history, but you can sign up for the month. You can sign up to see if you can find anything, or you can sign up for a 14-day trial. Then um, if you really find a lot of things, which you will, you will find a ton on Ancestry.com because it's so searchable. My mom has given all her kids and grandkids many tutorials on these sites, but those aren't as fun as when she gives us mysteries to help her unravel. Just a few weeks ago, she sent out a new one where she was trying to identify the father of an ancestor. I sent them all the, the will, and it was a handwritten will, and so they had to print it out and try to read through it to see what it was, what what hints does it give you in that will on who these people are? And and Flora, again, took, took that will and made a map of what the properties looked like. And she has the neighbors next to each other, and she has where the kids' properties were in relation to one another. And then, you know, after they got all of the clues out of it, then 
it suddenly triggered my son, who hasn't really done any family history. He says, what have you done to me? You've hooked me into this. Now I'm interested in this family. So it was fun. The kids enjoyed it. it they realized that this was a real document that was done way back in 1789, I think it was. It's pretty amazing to have access to all these scanned, searchable documents, but Ancestry.com goes a step further and offers DNA testing. This is the technology Jackie is using to track down birth parents, etc. It's also proven to be its own little scandal generator. In my family alone, it's unearthed an affair or two, not to mention a new great aunt we never knew existed. DNA testing can also be really helpful in figuring out where ancestors have migrated from. The tests can't pinpoint where you're from exactly, but they, what they can do is match you to people who've also taken the Ancestry DNA test and tell you how closely you're related. And it tells you how well your DNA matches DNA from specific areas. For example, my parents were both around a 50% match with other DNA samples from England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, mixed in with a smattering of Scandinavia and northern France. This is especially helpful for those who've been adopted or who have ancestors who've been adopted. And as more testing happens worldwide, it can even help groups like African Americans who have little to no documentation on their origins to be able to start to identify locations with similar DNA. So exciting to think of the possibilities. The last tip for today is to take kids to significant family history sites. My friend Raja's kids have, to, have had to rely heavily on technology to get to know their extended family as their father and maternal grandparents are for both first-generation immigrants from Sweden and Bangladesh. But they have been able to travel a little bit to see the places where their ancestors are from. And they hope to do more traveling in the future. We've gone back to Sweden a few times. Johan has almost all his dad's side of, well, all, his whole dad's side of his family is there. And so we try to kind of tell stories about growing up. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to take them to Bangladesh yet, which is unbelievable. But it's either there's political climate stuff that's not great or the summers aren't awesome there because of the monsoon season and the weather gets really hairy. But hopefully soon. I mean, one of the nice things are, you know, everyone in Bangladesh, like all my cousins and everybody, they all speak English now. They didn't when I was growing up. But so I, I at least spoke the language with them. I obviously don't speak at home because I think it's really hard to do and teach kids another language when both people don't speak it um, and they don't hear it. And plus, English is still my first language. So I don't, you know, I think in English. So it's really hard to just speak it unless I'm with people who are also speaking it. Um, yeah, we, you know, we just, we talk a lot about like what different places are like and what the cultures are like. And I kind of, you know, talk about like what it was like for me growing up, uh, being first generation here and kind of how my parents were when they came over and what kind of expectations they had, which they then of course changed over the course of time as they had to, you know, bring up American children, not Bangladeshi children and stuff. So, um, so I give them a lot of credit for, for changing a lot of their ideals and, and things that they thought would happen when they first had kids. It really is interesting to see how visiting family history locations can impact connection to these ancestors. Again, technology can help here. Watching documentaries and looking places up online aren't quite as good as the real thing, but it's pretty cool how much information we have access to at our fingertips. My own mother actually moved back to her hometown about six years ago, and not only is it her hometown, but both sides of her family were among the first settlers of the valley. So, for our 2019 family reunion, she and my dad went above and beyond to help their kids and grandkids connect with their heritage in the Heber Valley in Utah. They took a page from the TV show Relative Race and created our own version. It was one of the most amazing things I've ever been a part of. I'll let her explain. I wanted to tell my story to these, these kids, and so I set up a game where we would break up in four groups, and each group would go to a different place to begin with, and I started out with having each of them go to a place that I had worked as a teenager. And then after they had done that, we split them into groups and sent them to four different places that rotated in a round robin sort of thing. And it, it, the cemetery was the, the thing that started it off in my mind because I have 28 direct ancestors buried in one cemetery. And, and that cemetery has only been there since the, like, 18... 60 or something like that to have that many ancestors in a one single cemetery that are direct 
is quite unique. At the cemetery, we had, it was just a treasure hunt, really. And so I had walked out how many steps it was between headstones that were related to us. And some, of, there was, it was a pretty big cemetery. So I would tell him where to park. Then I would tell him to face away from the car and walk so many paces, look to the left, and then you'd find this one. And then we'd walk to another one. What they had to do is take a picture of the stone and they had to mark it on a pedigree chart that they had found him. And so they were making checks on the, on the pedigree chart as they found them. But I had them walking from one to another. And if they got off course, they would have to go back to the one that they got lost on and, and find the next headstone. Oh, and it, at each place uh, was a story about that person. So, so they would get to know some of their ancestors as they walked through the graveyard. <laughs> so then I had the kids go to each of the schools that I had gone to and told them stories about what happened in the in those schools and and one of the schools my dad was a principal of and it had his picture in there and they walked in and this old old building and here's my dad's picture having them honor him and so that helped them connect to having great grandpa be my principal and then they went to two other spots where the schools were so old that they were torn down and one was a park, and so I had them play a game in the park, and one was just a vacant lot. <laughs> so, And then there's a hill in our hometown that has is a memorial hill that for the vets, and my dad's name is up there, so I had them find his name up on top of the hill. And, and then another one was uh, we have two bodies of water that have covered up two ancestral homes in my family, and I told them all about the place that we water ski and do fun things is net is over the home of one of our ancestors and told them just fun stuff like that. Okay, one of the stops was to my grandparents' house and I told them that I lived only a, ha- a block away from each of my grandparents. And so I had them go to my grandmother's house, my grandpa and grandma's house, and we know the lady that lives there, and she let them walk through the house and see the different things inside the house, and it was it was pretty fun. And then they went down to my mother's house, and um, she told them stories about when I was a little girl and, and things like that. Then we went over to my other grandma's house, and we got to, there was nobody at home, but we got to stand outside the, the house and look at how small it was, and they had seven children in it. The whole thing took hours to complete, really the better part of the day, with games and challenges, and food of course, at many of the stops along the way. It was an incredible, immersive experience, and I'm so grateful for my parents for making it all happen. My parents are currently making plans for part two, my dad's side of the family, in Sacramento, California. Pretty incredible. Whether you want to go big like my genealogy-crazed mom, or just share simple stories and memories once in a while, helping your kids connect with their ancestors just might help them connect with who they are and who they can become. Thank you so much for listening to the How She Moms podcast and for being part of this community. There are so many other ways for you to connect and hopefully also contribute. I share tips and ideas regularly on Instagram and Facebook at How She Moms, and we also have a Facebook group that you can join, which is the main place for more philosophical discussions about the ideas I'll be discussing on future episodes of the podcast. It's also one of the best ways for you to contribute to future episodes. You can find past episodes and other resources at HowSheMoms.com. I have big plans for revamping my site this fall, so stay tuned for that. And you can always just email me directly at whitney at howshemoms.com. Special thanks to my own wonderful mom, Susan Singley, for recording my theme music. She played this song all the time when I was growing up, and to me, it's the soundtrack of motherhood.